Okay, everybody. Welcome to the next installment of the Open Worm Journal Club. We're talking today about how a worm develops. Uh, I'm Stephen Larson, project coordinator for the Open Worm Project at openworm.org. I'm really excited uh, to present this topic today um, as we've got um, uh, the, the core of the group uh, known as DevoWorm uh, that has been uh, going beyond uh, the initial scope that uh, I think we've had for Open Worm for a while, which is just to focus on how an adult, how an adult's behavior is driven by its cells and is diving into the infinitely interesting space of how we can start to build computational models of the development of any organism, really, but using sort of the worm as a focal point uh, for that. And so... Um, if this uh, effort is uh, successful, uh, we could have worms that uh, grow up and then start behaving uh, to continually close the loop, which I think would be really, really awesome. Uh, the subject of how development works is, is endlessly fascinating, and we've got a great group of folks here uh, today to uh, talk through it and um, uh, who've been really passionate about this topic and um, have been doing some really excellent work. So... Um, uh, without further ado, um, uh, so I would like to introduce everybody, uh, maybe get a sense of where folks are. I'm in Boston, uh, Massachusetts right now. Um, so we'll just kind of go down the line here and uh, get a little round of introductions, and then uh, we'll end with Bradley here, uh, who will be uh, doing the presentation today. So let's start uh, first with uh, Tom. Hi. Uh, my name is Tom Portuguese, and um, uh, my interests, I'm in around, I'm near Seattle, Washington. Uh, USA, and um, I've been a, a, a long-time uh, aficionado and researcher in artificial intelligence and machine learning, so I'm more from the computational side of things, but um, uh, about three years ago, I kind of fell in with the open worm effort, and C. elegans is a, an amazing creature to learn about how nervous systems compute things, so uh, it's it's an endless bounty of, of problems to work on. Enough said. Next. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's go to Timothy next. Uh, yeah, I'm in Alberta, well, Calgary, Alberta, Canada here. Um, I just finished a PhD in uh, basically looking at uh, transcriptional regulation in C. elegans. So how the genes are turned on and off. Um, so specifically, I was working, looking to find uh, actual sequences in a gene promoter that regulate um, basically the, the transcription of that gene, so when it's turned on. <clears throat> and that's, that's me. Excellent. Dick? OK. Uh, I'm uh, Dick Gordon. I'm a... Uh, theoretical biologist, uh, retired from the University of Manitoba. I'm living in a small town in Manitoba right now named Alonza. Total population 75, not counting dogs. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I've been involved in uh, developmental biology since my thesis back in about 1968. Uh, uh, and uh, nice. the, the nematodes have uh, Always been a fascinating opportunity, and uh, working with the, the rest of the people here, it's uh, turned out we're, we're starting to get some very interesting stuff. Okay, I also work in uh, computer tomography, uh, and uh, uh, so I'm reasonably well versed in three-dimensional imaging, which we eventually hope to combine with this. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dick. Uh, Gabriel. Sweet. Uh, hi, I'm Gabriel Pasquale. I'm uh, in Ann Arbor right now at the University of Michigan. I'm a junior studying computer science and mathematics. Um, I started working with Tom this summer, and <coughs> I'm from uh, Seattle originally. So, yep. Great. Excellent. Okay, and uh, so we may have some other folks dropping in and out here a little bit, um, but uh, uh, for now, it looks like... Um, Let's go ahead and go to our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Bradley Alicia. I'm Bradley Alicia. Uh, I have I'm in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and I have a pretty 
diverse background uh, in biology and in computational science. I have studied a number in a number of different areas, and I'm rather new to C. elegans. I've only been studying C. elegans a couple of years, uh, but I find that to be an, a good opportunity for a model organism that allows you to go between like computational studies and uh, uh, biological studies. And so, so you'll see some of that today. And I've kind of become uh, the Diva Worm project has become one of my main areas. So. And actually, we're starting, as Dick said, we're starting to get some good results in the area. So, Great. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hear what's new with DevoWorm. All right. Let me share the screen. All right. So we're developing, as I said, this is a sort of a project that's straddling computational biology and more conventional biology. So we have a number of different uh, approaches here and, and we'll see as we go along how that's how the work is divided up. Um, so last time I, we gave a talk here, this was September of 2014. And at that time we had uh, done some initial work and this is a, a technical paper or preprint that was published in 2014. Uh, so it covered, uh, you know, basically what we were doing with the lineage tree and with some of the computational explorations in terms of visualization of trees and things like that. So since that time that that was uh, released, we've had 610 views on it, 301 downloads. So those are pretty moder re uh, modest readership statistics. But we've also had some tweets. Uh, so the first impressions on that paper was, you know, one person was very descriptive and they said it's a theoretical reinterpretation of embryogenesis plus an RDF-based viz framework, right? That's pretty descriptive. And then we had Twitter comments like this, are differentiation waves computing a worm more complex than Michelangelo computing David? Which is a bit more like just an open question. Um, so we've got some feedback on it. Um, and, you know, the Diva Worm project is uh, sort of a transient project. People can move in and out and make contributions whenever they want. So uh, we had six authors on this at the time. Those were just the people in the group. Uh, right now I'm going to present on projects that three of the people have uh, been in, you know, they've been working on with discussions and, and content and that. Um, other people are welcome to contribute new things or um, you know, makes it, you know, it's pretty open. So that's the philosophy here. It's much like the regular open worm project. So as uh, Stephen mentioned before, we're kind of uh, different from the rest of the open worm project in that the rest of the open worm project is over here doing things like movement validation and simulation and optimization of code. And we're kind of over here doing these little different regular open projects. Project. So, is, um, yep, looks like Mark's joined us. Well, we got, I went ahead and uh, muted because there was an echo. Oh. So, Mark, we'll catch you. We'll catch you on the intro on the other side. Okay. So, go ahead. So, yeah. So, this is the Open Worm project, and then this is the Diva Worm project. So, we're trying to connect with the rest of the Open Worm project, and we're basically right now kind of doing that in two ways. We're collecting and processing data and doing simulations which can later be more general, generally applied to the Open Worm project. And then we're involved in community outreach. So what we're doing right now or uh, through educational efforts. And those, those things aren't as uh, prevalent right now in the project, but those are, that's kind of where we fit into the Open Worm project. So if there are people who are interested in the Open Worm project, we're also interested in development or in simulation, they might check out the Diva Worm project. They might actually be able to contribute quite a bit. There's a lot of open area in the Diva Worm project. So what we did since that initial paper was we decided to go beyond uh, gain access to secondary data sets and to 
work on simulation platforms for simulating morphogenesis and development. And so we have, I've been doing this more recently is to divide the group up into three interest groups. And this is just arbitrary, so I'm going to go through and describe each interest group and what's going on right now. Those will likely change over time as the project develops, but right now this is how they stand. So the first is the digital morphogenesis interest group, and that's mainly right now involving morphozoic. And I'll talk about what that is, and that involves Tom and Gabriel and Steve McGrew, who's not here today. So this is actually culminating right now in a book chapter. So Tom is actually working on this platform. And what it is is it's a cellular automata. But it's a special type of cellular automata, and it involves uh, what he calls nested neighborhoods. And so we're going to be actually submitting this book chapter today. Uh, it's like a, proof of, a series of proof of concepts on this platform and a discussion about cellular automata and complexity and development and it's uh, It'll be fun to read, and it will make it available to the community once it's published. Um, so the Morphozoic platform, really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to devise an abstraction that models morphogenesis in this cellular automata model using a nested neighborhood. And basically it's where in cellular automata you have a neighborhood of cells around a main single cell. And then those cells influence the state of the um, single cell that you're concerned with. So you have a bunch of neighbors, you have a single cell, and the cell is listening to its neighbors, and based on its their states, you adapt your state accordingly. Now this works across, this is a parallel processing thing, so every cell is listening to all of its neighbors. Uh, what the nested neighborhood does is extend that to more global neighborhoods. So you're not just listening to your immediate neighbors, you're listening to a more global signal. And this is how maybe we can achieve morphogenesis. Um, the reason why this is done in cellular automata is because we're embodying a scheme that is computationally feasible. Um, we know that we know what cellular automata can do, we know that you can implement rules in this environment and come out with uh, interesting patterns that evolve over time. So we can actually use this. We can go forwards and apply the rules and backwards and extract rules from uh, global behaviors. Um, so cellular automata are initially two-dimensional grids, although they can be three-dimensional. Uh, each cell has a state value. It emits and reacts to signals in the environment, which is basically the state of other cells. Uh, these signals carry information about the state of that neighborhood or those local cells. And in this case, we're using a field or a morphogenetic field, which is sort of a uh, mechanism to sort of gain a sense of the confluence of signals by each cell. So a cell will send signals not just from a single neighbor, but from multiple neighbors. Nick had a question. Oh, okay. Um, so. Okay. Uh, so in morphozoic, the cell state is a type, and you have these three by three more neighborhoods, which are a standard thing in cellular automata. And then the cell state in that neighborhood, and then plus the set of rules, determine how that cell changes state over time. And then we have this morphogen, which is a uh, morphogenetic field, so you basically it's the behavior of lo these local and global neighborhoods. And so, I mean, this is like a lot of words, but this is an image of what a CA looks like. You have a neighborhood here, you have a cell, and the, you know they're different. I mean, Tom could, if you're interested, Tom can describe this in a lot more detail. But you're basically measuring the interaction you know between this cell and its neighbors and a larger neighborhood and then you're doing you know it's doing some integration of that information um, you also have metamorphs which embody a cellular automaton through the generation of an action rule so a metamorph is you know one of these meta rules we have rules at the local scale metamorphs I, I, as I take it are rules at the more global scale and 
then you know that produces a pattern, and they're generated. It can be generated um, from a manual or program sequences of configurations. And a good way, good starting point to understand this is to understand the game of life. Uh, the, the game of life uses programmed rules to process the CA cell states. Um, so this is a, a artificial neural network where you're actually doing, you're sorting through these metamorphs. Um, and you're actually able to then, or hopefully classify these metamorphs as rules. And another reference for this is to look at Stephen Wolfram's work on cellular automata and rules. And he actually has classified classified a bunch of rules from these cellular automata behaviors that you can observe. And there are four classes of behaviors, but there are 200 rules. And all of these rules are just basically, uh, the pattern looks like something or does something, and it's based on just a sequence of, you know, cells uh, in the neighborhood are doing something, the focal cell is responding, and that's basically, you can look at that and find rules. And so it's it's a you know it's a sort of a uh, sort of a global way. It's not a reductionist way of looking at morphogenesis. It's very global. Um, I mean, I'm just going to go quickly through two examples that we have in the book chapter: uh, Conway's Game of Life and the evolution of a gastrulation sequence. And then there are others as well, but I won't get into those. Uh, the first is, and then there's John Conway and his Game of Life. So. In the game of life, you have a series of rules, and these are just operating in that local neighborhood, and they produce these patterns that you see on the grid. Um, some of them move, some of them are highly structured in a, in a shape, uh, but basically you can generate all these things with these rules. And then you can actually reverse engineer some of these CA rules to find other information about what's going on. Um, so, but then, you know, you ask, well, what does it have to do with development? It doesn't seem like it's very gr well grounded in developmental processes because we have a lot of different things like, you know, uh, gene expression, the regulation of gene expression, and things like that. But what we can actually do is produce patterns that look like something that you would find in development. So that's what this gastrulation example is where you can grow from a pattern from a single cell. So you have a single cell, you apply these rules, and you end up with this pattern over time. And this actually uh, answers a question that we have in theoretical biology. And that is Dick Gordon's uh, sort of conundrum of the spherical cow. And what one of the things he's given in his talks over the years is he's described this problem where you have an embryo, which is con which consists of round cells, and the embryo itself is basically round. How do you go from the sphere to something highly asymmetrical like a cow? And you can see the spherical cow here. Uh, you know, we don't have a spherical cow. This sphere doesn't just grow in size. It actually gets defined in terms of shape. And so this is what we're trying to do here, is define, you know, how you go from like a little blob to a shape. And the mechanism, of course, is probably far different in the cow from what we're simulating here. But the idea is that you have this, you can basically imitate this pattern. So that's the what we're doing in that interest group. And, you know, there are probably people, uh, I think Mark Watts is interested in doing some programming in this area to develop this further. So there are opportunities for uh, a collaboration there. Another area is uh, Dick and I are doing work on developmental dynamics, and this involves secondary data from not only from C. elegans, but from an organism called Ciona intestinalis, which is a, um, and I'll explain what a tunicate is to some of the people here. Um, so back from the first paper, what we were trying to do was very crude sort of modeling of embryogenetic biology. So this is the biology, of, the cell biology of what we're trying to do in development. We have a P0 cell, and it's differentiating into two different cells here, AB and P1, and then it differentiates further 
into these lineages, these sublineages. So the lineage tree that exists for C. elegans is actually a model of all of these cells differentiating over time. And C. elegans is a very specific way of doing this that's very deterministic. So it's not like mouse or human where you get cells that proliferate and divide and proliferate and take on different fates. This one you have, if you have cell, if you have differentiation of cells, a lot of times they already have a defined fate. They're just, you know, they keep subdividing until they become specialized. So the AB sublineage has, is all these cells are going to take on a specific range of fates. And then as they differentiate further, they get to be specific cells that we see in the adult. And so we tried to do some, I, or I, we were working on some, a uh, little bit of modeling on this earlier, but we have better data, and we're getting better data all the time. And the idea is that we can get positional data, we can get data on gene expression, and perhaps model what these cells are doing in development. So one of the things that kind of came out of all of this was that we figured out that you can deconstruct lineage trees. Um, now Dick has been doing this for years with his differentiation trees, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about how this can be done in other ways as well. So all C. elegans cells are the product of these ancestor descendant divisions. And so the lineage tree that you know is actually a directed acyclic graph. And that's a technical term, which means that you have this tree that branches in a binary manner and it's directed in one direction towards, you know, an adult phenotype. Um, now, these lineage trees are based on heredity and axial relationships. So the lineage tree, as Salston defined it in the 60s or 70s, uh, basically has a very sort of rudimentary anterior-posterior orientation. So you can go from one end of the tree to the other at the tips, and you can go down the worm from, from the uh, head to the tail. But that doesn't tell you a lot about where the cells are in the, the embryo necessarily. It just tells you its general region in the, on that axis. So, but what if we can other, use other sort of graph representations or other criterion, which would move us away from this lineage tree? We would preserve the, um, we might preserve the, um, the hereditary information we might not, but we can use information and just really play around with this. So, First of all, what if we were to reorder the descendants of each cell using a different criterion? And second, even more, you know, even more interesting, what if we were to unroot this tree and use those 3D spatial coordinates that we can capture using uh, special types of microscopy as a criterion for building a, a representation of a embryo and its cells? So right now we have this five-dimensional data structure, and the data structure is based on the position of cells in an embryo. And this is an XYZ representation. So it's anterior, posterior, left, right, and dorsal ventral. So we have the sphere, but we can define cells within the sphere. And this is a just a sort of a huge, this is all the data that I had in this data set and all the cell positions. And what we can do is average those down to for each cell and find mean positions for each cell because there aren't this many cells in the C. elegans embryo and determine an XYZ coordinate. But we can also look at the lineage tree and extract a couple of pieces of information from that as well. Well, one is this time variable, which is where you have time unfolding. So you have the single cell and then you have this differentiation event and that's one unit of time. And then you have another differentiation event and that's two unit, units of time. So you have the time dimension, and you have this order, which is I, which is, and I said in the lineage tree, it's anterior, posterior. In some cases, we can actually turn that around and ask the question, if we have a mother cell here and it differentiates, can we order it so that the smaller cell is in this direction and the larger cell is to the right? And we can do that for locally for each cell in the lineage as it differentiates. Uh, the reason for this is... So can I ask a question here? Yeah. 
cool. Um, so this um, embryo space, which is really cool, does it change dimension? Does it get bigger as the hair grows? Well, we're using a, a, a single coordinate system, so it doesn't actually, I mean, the space, the number of cells grows within the space, but you have, like, you know, well, you look at the original embryo, like, you have, and this is based on cell nuclei, so you have, like, a cell in the middle, and then you have two cells here, and then they divide, and you, actually, the space technically, it's larger in, the, in terms of the point cloud, but it actually isn't, because the cell would be, you know, the cell volume would be around the same size. So we're looking at nuclei, which is, you know, set where the centroid of a cell. So it doesn't necessarily change, but you have this continuity of reference point. In, in the, Got it. Yeah. And does this go up to a specific stage or a specific number of divisions before that would need to change? Because obviously... Yeah, so, I mean, I mean we're just it, dealing with... At the, the point that the thing hatches, right? It, yeah. So we're dealing <laughs> largely with the pre-hatch embryo. And I think the examples I'll show you here involve, like, you know, okay. two to 400 cells or something, depending on the analysis. But, yeah, it's it's not... It's early embryo embryogenesis. So, and so the reason for this sort of sorting or resorting is, you know, there are theoretical concerns. So in differentiation tree theory, which Dick has written about, extensively, you get these expansion waves and contraction waves. A, a larger cell on this side is an expansion wave, smaller cell on this side is a contraction wave, and that has to do with the differentiation process. And so, I mean, we're still kind of working out the implications of all that, but the idea is if you can resort this order, what kinds of things does it yield? Um, so what can we do with, we can do other things with this five-dimensional data structure. Once we define it and once we work it out, we can work it out with more refined data. We can work it out with other parameters that we can come up with at a later date. Uh, but basically, we can use all of these as classificatory criterion. We can establish a model of pure mosaic development where cells divide in a binary fashion and possess a deterministic state. Now in C. elegans and in other so-called uh, mosaic organisms, that always isn't, isn't always the case. You do have exceptions to that, but if we wanted to build a model of pure mosaic development, we could use this as a template. Um, and then we can compare between species. So we have C. elegans and we have C. ona intestinalis, and we don't have the data aren't exactly the same, but we have a similar sort of logic to how we're looking at the CON intestinalis data. So here's an example of C. elegans. We all know C. elegans. Uh, this is our paper here, and it was distributed with the materials in the talk. So if you want to read the paper, it's being submitted. It's under submission. So, um, but basically, all the components are there, and hopefully, it makes sense. And if people have questions, they can email Dick or myself. Uh, this is an example here of, down here on the slide, this is an experiment where the P1 sublineage in the, in the embryo was isolated from the rest of the embryo during gastrulation. And this shows like kind of patterns that can form in this type of development. So they isolated the P0 cell from the rest of the embryo and they let it divide. Now, since this is a deterministic process, it actually doesn't need any more information than the P1 cell. It's going to execute its program. But the thing is, is that once it's separated out from the rest of the embryo, it forms characteristic patterns of cell division. And so there are spatial sort of patterns in here. Uh, now, when the, the cell isn't dissociated, when the embryo isn't dissociated like that, you don't get quite this pattern of differentiation. Nevertheless, we expect these type of spatial patterns to exist. We can also compare it with the tunicate or sea squirt. And this is, a, this is an interesting organism because it has the same uh, lineage tree that you would see in the C. elegans, but you actually see it's, it has a much different biology. But we're may actually making a comparison early in development. So in early development, it actually has a very similar biology. Um, so you have this up to gastrulation, you have these cells that divide in a binary fashion and form this sphere, this embryo. 
Um, and then, but after that point, and we, we're not looking after that point in our analyses, you start getting this differentiation where you start getting this, like a tadpole structure where you have this head and a tail, and then you end up, it goes through metamorphosis and it ends up forming these uh, tube-like structures. Um, now, it's interesting that this is a chordate. So this is an organism that's more closely related to humans than C. elegans is. It doesn't look like it, but that's what, that's what the biology is. And so we can take these two organisms and compare them in different ways. And so one of the ways we can do that is to derive things like a differentiation code from these division events. And so um, we know, for example, that there's a mother-daughter triplet, that the mother gives birth to two daughter cells, and that translates into an organizational scheme. Now, in the Siona intestinalis, the lineage tree is sort of not anterior, posterior, but there's a radial organization to it, which I still don't understand completely, but that's the way it, it if you look at the um, map, of the, the fate map and everything of the uh, developing embryo, and you look at the tree, you can tell. But anyways, um, when it, so this idea of a differentiation code is really not that hard to understand, I guess. Uh, it's when a parent cell divides, two daughter cells result. As I said before, the smaller cell from that division is placed on the left-hand side, and the larger cell is placed on the right-hand side. And this is done recursively across the tree. So you have a number of mother cells at a certain level of dif uh, differentiation. So say we have a 16-cell embryo. Each of the 16 cells is going to produce two daughter cells. Each of those daughter cells you can, you know, you can figure out from measurements which one is larger, which one is smaller. Then you sort those offspring cells in that way. So they're sorted, but we still have the hereditary information because we don't, at this point, decouple the mother cells from the daughter cells. And so this actually gives you something called a differentiation code. So this actually generates for each cell a binary string. And the idea is that you go from the top of the tree, the root of the tree, and you go down. And you look at, like, whether the cell is gone, the division is, goes to the left or goes to the right. So any one cell has a code based on, you know, if you go from the single cell and you follow it through the tree, do you have to go left or do you have to go right to get to that cell that you're interested in? And then each left-hand branch is zero, each right-hand branch is one, and then it's just a string of those numbers. And so that gives us a code that's actually convertible not only to uh, comparisons within the tree, but with other organisms as well. And it's actually, you can do this, generate this type of code for lineage trees, we call it a lineage code, or differentiation trees, which we call a differentiation code. So this is a, kind of an example graphically of what I'm trying to describe here. Um, this is the typical lineage tree. So you see that AB is here, ABA and ABP are here as daughter cells. The ABA has a left-hand branch because it's anterior to ABP, which is posterior, which goes right. Now that's the Salston logic of organizing these trees. We go to the next one where we can see, now in this case, we classify the lineage tree using this binary code. We preserve the order so we don't flip anything. So we have the AB cells, which is classified just as a zero. I mean, there's another event up here which makes it a zero, but uh, the AB cell, let's say, has a code of zero. If we look down at ABA and ABP, because ABA branches to the left, it's a code of zero, zero, and ABP branches to the right, so it's a code of zero, one. The order is preserved, but then when we go to the differentiation tree and we classify that, that's where it changes. So you have this AB cell, you have ABP now, because this is smaller than ABA, you have, it's over on the left, and the ABA is over on the right. So we've actually reorganized it based on size instead of based on some axial criteria. And then the code changes as well. So it's, it's a little bit different way of looking at the tree. Um, so we've actually built these different, we were building these differentiation trees. It just involves doing this resorting by this criterion, figuring out the topology from the lineage tree, and then producing this tree. And then having a, like a scale, a time scale here, 
and actually going into the literature and annotating some of these cells. And at this stage of the embryo, these cell, these air, these colored areas represent putative tissues. So they aren't like formal tissue types yet, but people have figured out what these are going to, what kind of tissues these are going to become. So some cells don't really have a putative tissue type. Others have certain tissue types that they're going to become. And I, this isn't really visible. You can't see anything here on the slide, but these are actually published on the web, and these will be in the paper. So uh, I don't know. It's in the abstract where these are on the web. So you can actually download the entire file and, like, zoom in on things. And so we've actually done this for not only for C. elegans, or for C. intestinalis and the axolotl, which is something that Dick has done previous to this project. And we're actually looking at that tree right now as well. And then future work involves producing these type of differentiation trees for organisms like Drosophila. And again, it's largely uh, not only just for that biology of that organism, but to also make comparisons across species. And so in mosaic organisms, which we have with C. elegans, each cell is a um, the sort of contraction wave and expansion wave. Each cell is considered a tissue. In regulative organisms, you have multiple cells that form a, a tissue, but these branches still represent contraction wave and expansion wave. You're just looking at sets of tissues in regulative organisms like mouse and human and axolotl instead of single cells. But this puts it in a common framework. So one of the ways we can look at this is through using information theory. So we have our lineage tree and we have our differentiation tree. And we have our codes, which are classifiers, basically. And we can capture the position of nodes in the tree. But then, as I showed you, they flip. So at every level, they are, there's a potential for a transposition of these cells. And so as you go through the tree, you can think, well, yeah, there are going to be a lot of transpositions of, of cells. In, the, in their order. And so the question is, how do you like visualize and understand what that those kind of transpositions are? Maybe they produce like, um, maybe they're, you know, you get a transposition maybe up in the four to eight cell stage, and then that's, you know, preserved throughout the rest of the tree. Or maybe it's just that these things get transposed at random. We don't know that. So the question is, we can figure out a way to measure that. Um, so we can actually use the Hamming distance, which is a tool from computer science, to look at how different one cell is in the differentiation tree from another cell in the lineage tree. And we can do that by comparing the lineage code and differentiation code, and then measure that distance in bits. Because remember, I told you that the different codes have uh, their own identity, but the because they're in different parts of the tree, the identity is different. And so you can actually look at the difference between those two identities because they're measured in bits by doing the, using the Hamming distance. So this is a visualization here of this example. So this is a tree, and if put it in a bivariate graph. So there are no connections between these nodes, but they have basically you have the root here, you have the two cell here, the four cell here, and it goes out. And these numbers are from 0 to, like, this is from 0 to 16, so it's 15, and it goes out along the axis. And then, so the idea is that you have, like, a cell here. You know, you, have a, you follow a two-cell here. You have a four-cell stage here. And you can follow this out along here. And this is basically part of a subtree. And you can see, if you look at the cells and its descendants, how many bits it is away between lineage tree and the differentiation tree. And so you can tell by using a different criterion, by sorting the cells by a different criterion, what is the, you know, what's, what's the difference. And if you see patterns, like in a subtree, as you can define by a cell and all its descendants, does that mean anything? Because it might mean something. It might mean that there's something going on in terms of differentiation, in terms of what the cells, do, what the cells are doing in that subtree, that's different from what you might learn from the lineage tree. And so this What's is the color a code? Oh, the color, oh yeah, I don't have a scale, but the color coder 
the number of bits away from zero. So uh, I think blue is zero, and then as you move out, you see more red and green, and that, that's like from one to three bits and from four to six bits. So I didn't put the scale on here, but the idea is that blue is zero, zero bits difference, and then green and red are, you know, moving out from zero. And yeah, it's in the paper, the entire graph with the legend and the results. So the idea is that as you get away from the root, you get a larger Hamming distance, obviously. But then in some subtrees, you're going, well, actually in some cases, you still see a difference of zero bits out on the edge. And that just means that it's been flipped back to its original position in the tree. And so there's a lot of interesting information in these. Um, we have, I mean, is the position is the position of the cell from left to right. Um, are they ordered in a in a specific way? Well, um, in the, so in the differentiation tree, they're ordered. Each pair is smaller to large cell. So the idea is that you have more or smaller cells on the left hand side of the tree, and more larger cells on the right hand side of the tree. But because you're evaluating at every division event, it's not a perfect match. Now, if this were like a, a highly ordered process where, you know, small cells produce small cells produce small cells, and large cells produce large cells produce large cells, the left-hand side of the tree would be mostly small, and the right-hand side of the tree would be mostly large. But that's not actually what happens. So the organization is roughly from smaller cell to larger cell from left to right. But there's variation because, you know, you get production of, sometimes you get highly asymmetric cells in terms of size sometimes. So here you can see in the differentiation tree you have a cell and it divides and then the proportion of the original cell size is shown here. So these two cells, you know, this has 100% of the size of these two cells. And the question is what's the percentage of the cell? If these were symmetrical divisions it would be 50-50 but it's actually somewhat asymmetrical 46 to 54 and then you know you have some um, variation in that but that's basically the idea and then this is your time frame which is also sort of condensed because um, you know there's a little bit of variation in division by sublineage but basically is this unfolds by division event so one the one cell the two cell the four cell and it occurs at certain minutes in development. So this is the 112 cell stage, which is 273 minutes after the one cell stage. And so this is a type of data we can extract. This is all secondary data. Um, and you can say the same, see the same thing for C. elegans. You have a little bit different um, setup here because you have more, uh, more cells in the C. elegans case. But you also have these putative tissues. You have this uh, asymmetry and division. You and you can also produce this graph type of graph where you have you start out with a difference of zero between the lineage tree and the differentiation tree, and then you move out. And in this case, actually in C. elegans, it's a bit more regular because you can see streaks of red and streaks of green. So these are subtrees where you have a distance of maybe like one or two bits away from the, um, I think in this case it's the differentiation tree. Uh, there's a distance to the lineage tree which is like two bits and in other subtrees you have a distance which is higher and I haven't done a formal analysis on every cell but you know there, there's I think there's a little bit more regularity in the C. elegans case. In any case that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is the what we call the cast code and this is actually something that Dick came up with um, so this is very similar to the BLAST code. And the CAST code is where you can take these um, differentiation codes and you can actually compare them between species. Um, but you can do it in a way that's maybe more rigorous than just making a broad statement about, like, what is the shape of the tree or something like that. You can actually generate, because I said that the ID of a differentiation, cell in a differentiation tree is unique you can compare between two species to see which types of cells they have in common. So which types of cells have gone through expansion waves and contraction waves of a certain sequence. Um, and so we 
use an analogy to the blast sequence because it's very similar to it. Um, we just take our binary states and we convert it to a letter code, which is what they use in a in a blast search, you know, with uh, DNA and, and amino acid sequences. You take your uh, first letter as the prefix, which is the level of the tree, and then the suffix is this code, which is converted from zeros and ones to C's and E's, which is the contraction wave and expansion wave. And this is kind of an arbitrary way to do it, but it makes it easier to align. And then you can align the two sequences. So you can take two trees, which produce like a sequence of, of uh, codes, and then you can align them. And the alignment method that we use is based on Needleman and Wunsch, the Needleman and Wunsch algorithm, which is shown here. And it's actually a form of dynamic programming where you have, a, so we align our different species, C. elegans, cast codes. This is just a, a, a section of the tree for each organism. This is a toy model that I've built uh, from E, this to F, this code. And so you can see we've aligned them first of all so that you have, you know, you have matches across the sequences, but you also have gaps. And the gaps exist where, so like this unique code in Siona intestinalis doesn't exist in C. elegans for some reason. And so to characterize those gaps and the similarities, we actually can put them into this matrix and calculate a score based on uh, giving a point for each match and then penalizing the gaps. And, this, and you end up with a score of 8. And you have a length here of the alignment, which is 14, and a score of 8. So the idea is that the length of the alignment can be, you know, if there are more gaps, it's going to be longer. And if there are more gaps, the alignment score is going to be a little bit lower. And so you can actually then, uh, if, if you had every, if everything matched perfectly, the length of the alignment and the score would be exactly the same. But because it's their gaps, it's going to be different. But so, question on this? Yeah. Uh, um, okay, so um, each uh, differentiation code uh, refers to a single cell. Is that right? Yeah, each cell has a unique code. Okay, so in order to be in this, uh, for this chart that you're looking at here, what does it take for a cell to make it into a row or a column in order to kind of qualify for being um, compared? And then what is the uh, ordering that you're using here? Because it's sort of an implicit um, assumption that I think that like from 0 comma 0 outward is like um, progression of differentiating. Is that is yeah. that accurate? Or so maybe? yeah, so each tree you're going to have like you start from a single cell, and if you have these binary divisions, you end up with, uh, you know, these expansion and contraction wave events. And so every tree is going to have, like, every tree is going to have a very similar uh, first couple levels. Up to the four cell, they're all going to have these same processes. But then later in the tree, you end up with divisions that don't, you know, they're not totally symmetrical, and so the topology is a little bit different. Um, so the idea is that you, each cell has a unique code, and in each organism, a lot of the cells are going to have matches in other organisms because the tree basically operates on this sort of binary division. So to make it into this uh, chart, this is just a section of the alignment. So we would take the codes, convert them to this, and then align these. So where you have a code with the same value for each species, that's a match. And so you just align it based on that. You find the matches, you know, and you align it. And then we're, you have, you're going to get gaps because you're going to have cells, say, like this one, which are unique to a single species and not in this species. And that's a gap. So the idea is... Right, so, I'm so I'm trying to understand the cause of, of gaps. So is it, is it that a cell... And apologies if I'm, if I'm uh, talking over my connection is not great. <laughs> so um, uh, on my side, there might be a delay. Um, but uh, what's going to cause a gap? So is it um, like the death of a cell um, that did divide? Because pretty much, don't you always get you always get binary divisions, right? So, but then again, obviously organisms are different. So, so what's actually I'm just the intuition behind what's going to cause a gap? 
Yeah, it's a well, it's a, a unique way. So it's, most of the time there are uh, binary divisions that produce, but not always because in some of the stem cell lineages you have asymmetric divisions. You have missing data there in, in a lot of the trees. You also have some areas of the tree. So most of the like most of the time you don't have gaps, but you occasionally do have gaps. It just depends on how the tree unfolds. Uh, Siona intestinalis is kind of a weird tree because, like I said, it has a little bit different um, okay. way. Yeah, the, the embryo is structured a little bit differently, so you're going to have differences in the way that these things are produced. And especially if you go out to like axolotl, there you you are just looking at tissues, groups of cells. So you're going not going to have the same sequence of events that unfold like that. So when you get a gap, it's a unique set of differentiation events for that cell that is in this species but not in this species. So this cell right, right. went through a, a unique process in this embryo versus this embryo. And so that produ th there's no counterpart in C. elegans until you get a gap. Right. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. So, it's, I mean, it's a, you know, it, you can compare across species this way um, in a very unique way. It's, I don't know about it, its ultimate power, but we can create, like, scores for different pairs of embryos and, you know. Uh, so then I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of uh, what something else we can do with these data. So remember I told you before that you can take the tree and reorder it. Now what we want to do is take all the connections of heredity and kind of throw them up in the air and say we have cells that are a certain distance away from each other in the embryo. Um, we know that like the AB lineage and P1 lineage descendants are in a certain part of the embryo generally, but we don't know like how in a three-dimensional space how they're actually their adjacency in, in terms of like a certain distance away. So we know for example that the AB lineage and P1 lineage are somewhat segregated in the embryo along maybe like a uh, single anatomical axis. And we know that there are um, some biases. If we look at a um, stuff that's been done in um, anatomy that there are certain, you know, that certain sublineages are restricted spatially. What we don't actually know is the higher sort of level geometry. And that's what we're doing here. We can actually take our 3D positions and then map them to this network structure and look at, given a certain distance from one cell to another, you know, what the structure is of, of um, maybe potential interactions is a good way to think about this. So cells are next to one another. They're maybe quite possibly going to interact. But if they're maybe a, a small distance away, and it's hard to tell from anatomical data, um, you know, maybe they're interacting as well. So this is a complex network, and they use this in connect, in um, brain connectomics, but we can use it, these in all different sorts of sciences. Um, this is where we've taken all the cells in the sublineage, this part of AB, and we've just looked at the position of these cells, and we've actually plotted them in space, and then drawn connections between them. So there's a certain Euclidean distance between each cell, and this is a 128 cell embryos, so there are actually 224 cells in this analysis. We're just looking at their position, the distance between them. Now in this case we've smeared it because AB doesn't exist when ARP exists. But we can look at actually the position of ancestors and the position of descendants. We can filter these data by, you know, single levels of the differentiation tree, and when we can produce these plots, which are networks, which basically, once you calculate a Euclidean distance between every cell, because we have that three-dimensional spatial information, we can build these networks and say, ask the question, how many cells are within 25% of the maximum distance of all other cells? So, you know, all these cells have connections because they have some spatial closeness to one another. Just have a um, quick question here. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with cell movement? Because during animal development, cells actually move around quite a lot, even in the yeah. worm. There's a cell that's formed in the tail that actually migrates to the middle of the worm to pattern the, the vulva. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a little bit imperfect because we're actually doing some averaging here. But 
um, we're just getting a sense of like its general average position in the embryo, and it's actually a pretty early stage of the embryo, so um, you know we're not getting a lot of that. But but we do have um, yeah we're not I mean we haven't really accounted for movement too much in this model. Do you have a plan as to how you will encounter movement, or how you will deal with movement when you get to a point where you encounter it? Or uh, well, I you know I mean there are other strategies for it. I guess we have um, we can look at like you know measurements of the cell from you know division to some position and just kind of look at where it ends up. So we can actually take time slices of the embryo and look oh. at like yeah. That'll work. yeah. So, I mean, you know, there are different ways. I'm just really trying to get a handle on, you know, how we can actually look at these positions. Because we actually do have, you know, we can actually ask the question, you know, can we look at different slices in time? And then the question is, is it appropriate to look at a level of the differentiation tree or of the lineage tree, or can we look at, like, more, you know, smaller intervals of where it's actually dividing and moving to its new position? Um, you know, is it just a division where it just stays in place and just kind of branches into two parts, or is there some movement? And we know from the literature that there is some movement around in uh, various axes, but, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of working that out as we go along. So, um, but in any case, what you can actually do here is get information from this hairball of connections, um, what's going on in terms of cells that are near each other in terms of the same sublineage or in terms of spanning two sublineages. So, you know, you can tell, for example, if there's a cell in the P1 sublineage that is nearby to the AB sublineage more so than it's maybe what you would expect to be its neighbor. I mean, basically, you're sort of teasing out the geom higher level geometry of the embryo and looking at it in the context of the lineage tree. So, I'm, we're, we're working on this. We'll be writing a paper on it. It's not quite there yet. So, um, <clears throat> But you can also ask the question, you know, are there cells that are sort of, are there areas of the embryo that are densely populated with cells versus not? Um, those are the type of questions you can ask with this model. So, and in fact, we find maybe that, say, in both the AB and P1 sublineage, that the number of connections goes down so that you don't have any you know, dense clusters of cells, but you have areas that have relatively few cells. And I should mention that in these network topologies, we actually take the Euclidean distance and threshold it at a certain uh, distance. So this represents maybe like any one cell, you know, 25% of the distance out in terms of the entire embryo. And, you know, how many cells do you have that are neighbors are connected and that's how you generate these graphs and in this case you actually do see a uh, some cells that are outliers in terms of a decrease and actually in between sublineages if you look at like you know the lineage identity of these cells and their proximity you actually see a linear decrease and it's actually a small a, you know lower slope so there are things like that that are sort of holistic analyses that are interesting, but we don't really have a huge smoking gun at this point as to what that means. Um, and so this may actually extend to regulative embryos as well, like the differentiation tree stuff. You can actually make these out of cells in the um, early embryos, like this is the 64 cell embryo of the mouse. And the mouse is interesting because you can't really build a reliable differentiate, or you can't really build a reliable lineage tree from mouse. Um, the cells, every time they differentiate, every time you get a different embryo, the order of the lineage tree changes because the cells aren't sort of deterministically determined like in C. elegans. They just kind of respond to local cues in mouse. So there's a different sort of process there, but nevertheless, you can look at like early divisions in terms of in terms of C. elegans, it's sublineage. In terms of mouse, it's inner cell mass and trophectoderm. And you can actually look at their relative positions and see what, you know, what the sort of the ge geometry of the cell is. You can look at different, you know, stratifications of the data. So you can look at, like, 
different levels of the lineage tree, or you can look at different stages of development, or you can look at even like, you know, if you can test hypotheses, like if a cell moves from point A to point B, what does that look like on this network? You know, if you threshold the distance from larger to smaller as you decrease, what's the connectivity look like? So you can do all sorts of experiments in these that, um, and complex networks give you the advantage of being very quantitative. You can measure a lot of the interactions. Whereas in an anatomical approach, you would just simply just, you know, make a statement about where these cells are and maybe what they do. So then the last part of this I'm going to go through really quickly because I don't want to spend too much time on it. This is an initiative I was working on in a lab at UIUC. Uh, some data that I collected that's available um, freely, it's open data, and it's experimental work with C. elegans. It's a little bit later in development. It's actually developmental plasticity related to reproduction. So. The first one, and there are two paper, bioarchives papers on this. The first one is um, evolution in eggs and phases. This is experimental evolution um, that was done on a wild type, then two wild type, and mutant genotypes. Um, now, we haven't talked about mutant genotypes, and we're kind of interested in doing some embryo embryogenesis studies on mutant phenotypes. Um, but as we know, C. elegans has a lot of very distinct mutant phenotypes and they're very well characterized. So you can get mutants that are defined that where you can order mutants that have like a mutation at a certain allele and they have a certain behavior or they have a certain sort of physiological set of characteristics. And so this is this work focused on those types of uh, worms. And uh, so generated data for 14 mutant and wild type genotypes. They underwent experimental evolution for fecundity. So the idea was you want to evolve strains for based on their reproductive capacity and see for different mutant, geno, mutant genotypes and see what the result is. And so this affects actually both subsequent um, reproduction in, in the descendant worms and developmental timing of reproduction. And so this is a graph that's uh, actually smoothed a bit from the initial time series. But this is 15 to 20 generations of different uh, genotypes. And you see that their population size is, was measured in the, these experiments is plotted here. So this is a proxy for fecundity. And you can see that we get different results for different mutant genotypes. And, you know, so depending on the mutation or class of mutation, we get different results. We get different levels of fecundity. Sometimes we lose the ability to reproduce. And so that's that's actually available as data. It's one param, you know, one set of parameters that we're interested in characterizing. Um, another is actually looking at development itself and looking at what happens when you mute, manipulate development at a certain point. And so in this case, we were looking at extended L1 arrest, and that's where you take a worm in an egg. You know, it's you take a bunch of eggs, you hatch them in liquid media. And you can extend their L1 stage, which is the first stage of um, larval development. You can extend this for like a week, and they get starved. They don't survive. I mean, they survive it, but they conserve energy as they're surviving it. And so the idea is that they, they're exhibiting this plasticity. And after they recover, if you put them on food, after about a week of being in L1, they retain their original life history, but they're affected in certain ways. So sometimes they don't produce as many offspring, or sometimes they don't grow, you know, they, their growth trajectory is, um, you know, impa impacted. So, but the thing is, is that you can test this in, in wild type and get a certain set of results, but you can also test it in mutants, especially mutations that uh, affect developmental pathways and metabolic pathways, and so that's what happened. We had, we do have these data for both wild type and selected mutants, uh, both that were ordered from the CGC, which is a clearinghouse for mutant worms and crosses that were made in the lab. And so we can see that you can actually take the data on, you know, a ser uh, number of worms uh, on a dis in create distributions of reproductive capacity after starvation, 
both actually in a control, which hasn't been starved, and after starvation of about a week. And so you get these parameters like the peak reproductive capacity, you get reproductive capacity per day, and then you can actually look at their parameters and how they change do this this developmental uh, perturbation. So one thing you can look at is you know a skew later in life in terms of reproductive uh, capacity. You have things like delay, which is where there's little to no reproduction for a while into adulthood, and then you get reproduction, or you get this sort of kurtosis in the function where there's a change in peak population size due to this developmental perturbation. And it's really, you know, I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of something that I was working on for, um, you know, I didn't really think about it in terms of how it would fit directly into the project, but I think it's interesting data to have because you're now you're looking sort of at getting closer to adulthood and the sorts of things that could, you know, the development, happen in development affect adulthood. Did Dick have a question? Oh, I'm sorry, did, did that come from a... Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, I missed, I missed part of what you said on that last slide. What was that? Uh, uh, the, the audio dropped out. I think I've just been on my end. Oh. After, after, pretty much. Yeah, so th the idea is we have these three parameters that you can capture from these data. I mean, th this involves, you know, a lot of experimental work where you're measuring worms and you're using, um, you know, these protocols to mod uh, modify development. And then you're actually looking at these population parameters. If you model them computationally using, um, you know, generating these distributions and then looking at the differences in the distributions between the control, which is where it hasn't been starved at all or per perturbed during development, and then this curve here where it has been perturbed during development. And right. you can actually measure this for different strains, and you actually get quite, you know, the differences are actually quite stark depending on the uh, mutation. So, you know, you have different classes of mutation that sort of behave similarly in other classes of mutation. So, like, you know, if you have a metabolic mutation, it might have a specific type of effect. If you have another type of developmental mutation, it might have another type of effect. And so it's something that we haven't really talked about in the open worm project is the role of mutant genotypes in your adult worm. But this is kind of, you know, moving in that direction a little bit. And it actually involves development because there are a lot of, in C. elegans you have specific points in development where if you affect it in some way, if you starve it or heat shock, it can affect the adult phenotype. Um, but that's, I mean, not in terms of the number of cells, but in terms of the Behave, some of the behavioral characteristics, reproductive characteristics, etc. Um, so I guess they'll wrap this up by talking about future directions. Oh, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, so these mutants are artificially produced then, correct? Yeah, so the way they produce mutants is they actually do, the, they do mutagenesis screens, which is where you can generate mutants through uh, means of just you know, you can, re they can um, produce them, like, through mutagenesis. You can look at, for them in natural populations and isolate them and backcross them and get, like, uh, individual worms that always have this mutation. But, okay. uh, the, well, yes, yeah, so there's a... I just wondered, uh, is C. elegans pretty prone to mutations, or is it pretty stable? Uh, well, you have, uh, well, because it's, it's a selfing organism, meaning it's <coughs> mostly, largely... A hermaphrodite. There is some sexual recombination, but it's I heard the thousand mutation project at a UBC. Yeah, and they they've basically done mutagenesis and sequencing, and they figured that the natural mutation very mutation rate of C. elegans was about one base pair per three generations. Yeah. Yeah. Which so is there, I mean, there is a hundred better, hundred million base pairs. So. Yeah. It's yeah, it's so it's like a, so it's fairly low but there's you know but you can actually the the idea though is that you can get mutant you know you can get mutations that have an effect on the 
phenotype or on the um, function, and it, they're actually pretty stable. I mean, even you have to do a lot of back crossing and other things, but you can get these lines that um, you know because they use it for like human disease research. Like they'll look at like um, aging or obesity, and they can actually um, get you know generate mutants and see elegans where they can look at the physiology, and they're a lot of people getting money for making cor uh, you know making correspondences to human health, and the reason you can do in C. elegans is because you know you have a short generation time and you can raise them and they're very targeted mutations, so you know I know exactly what they are, and so yeah. But th there's a whole area there of like mutants, like there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of mutants that have been uh, produced in labs that includes like crosses of mutants and you you know they all there's a website I can put it up on the slack space called CGC which is a group in Minnesota where you can actually order mutants you go through their catalog and it's like we have this gene here that's uh, might be a developmental mutation there are a couple of alleles you can order those and you can take them to you know you can do whatever you want with them and so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, it's it's low hanging fruit because it's easy to get the mutants. You don't have to like generate them every time you want to make new ones. But so um, yeah, I mean, we should talk about that more. Actually, um, I'm not sure what the opportunities are for that, but you know, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's not something that Open Worm has really talked. There's not too much in Open Worm about mutants, but um, so the future directions here. Are, um, you know, this is so our opportunities for collaboration. As I mentioned, you know, the philosophy here is that if you have anything you want to contribute, you're free to join in, you're free to suggest things, and uh, we can do things. You know, we can set something up. It's not like you have to be there every week. Just if you have something good to contribute. And with Diva Worm, it's great because, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not a very strict set of requirements really for contribution. I mean you don't have to be like an expert coder. You can be a biologist. You can be a um, you can have an interest in computational analysis. You can do like um, you know even like proofreading manuscripts or providing input, providing expertise. That's always welcome. And um, so but there are, are specific things that we'd like to push forward on. Uh, one of them is the semantic modeling and visualization stuff. So the RDF framework and things like like characterizing cells in terms of, of semantic information, that's still sort of there. I think now that we've gotten some secondary data, we can actually start to maybe make some contributions there. I really kind of, you know, build like a database of the cells in development and say, how does this fit in a little bit closer to what we have with the adult worm, um, you know, refining the data structures for representing development. So we don't have a lot of, we're kind of excluding a lot of stuff maybe. We don't have any gene, uh, genetic characterization really, and we need to have more like information about, you know, what the embryo, like more three-dimensional information about what the embryo is doing. Um, you know, because we're using like cell nuclei right now, and we would like to have full cellular models. And we're actually looking into doing, you know, getting some microscopy data that speaks to that. But that's that's those are all opportunities. Um, I guess integrating a lot of different types of data. Uh, so gene expression data is kind of missing here, but that's something that we could include, uh, including things like cellular automata rules to what we know about development. So like, okay, I mentioned before that we have these CA models, but they're sort of disconnected from the embryo models. How do we put that all together? And we're just continuing to do that. And I think if people have ideas about that, that would be great. And then also, um, a while back, I went to Indiana University, and I gave a talk on the uh, to the CompuCell 3D group. On It was a very high-level talk on Diva Worm, but... I think they like the idea a lot, and I think that uh, there are opportunities for C++ programmers, for people who are interested in agent-based models to, you know, sort of 
get their hands dirty and try to work through models of C. elegans. And this would be, these would be like real cellular models. So it would be based on data, but they're aging-based models where you actually have the cells, you have as much data underlying the model as you, as you want, and then you can simulate the function of the embryo. So, I mean, I saw their sort of hive mind at IU, and it looks pretty interesting, but uh, we need people <coughs> who can specialize in doing this to help. So all these things are possible, and uh, also mutant genotypes might be in the mix too, and there's a lot of opportunity there. So thank you for your attention. Um, to thank OpenWorm and some of the secondary data sets. Uh, so the secondary data was mainly from Zhirong Bao, who um, did a lot of this, pioneered a lot of this stuff with C. elegans, and they use uh, light sheet microscopy, and they use a program called Starry Night to capture the positions of nuclei. And so they do this in Siona. Uh, they do a similar thing in Siona, uh, intest analysis, and that's where we got our secondary data from Aniseed, and that's a database where they have data for the tunicate. And so, you know, if we can get more data like that, we can certainly make advances. Uh, also, thanking Nathan Schroeder and some of the people at the C. Elegans wet lab, where a lot of the stuff from the third part of the talk came from. And so, thank you for your attention. Great. So thanks, Bradley. Um, so question, um, and I, I know that you guys um, use uh, GitHub as a rallying point. Is there any particular repo that you would point any of the audience uh, who's watching here today at if they, if there's, uh, they want to play around with stuff? Uh, just uh, well, some we online don't, follow-up? Yeah, it's, I, I guess I can put together something. I, haven't, I really don't have anything right now where, I mean, I have a couple things on the abstract and there isn't, isn't a lot, it's not very code intensive in the conventional sense. We do have some data sets that sure. I can put them to, uh, which I can, I can bring together a list of those locations. Because yeah. we do do a lot of uh, data analysis, and I think Tom actually has a repository for Morphosite, yeah. too. Uh, yeah, G uh, Gabriel and I set up uh, a repository for Morphosite. So, so. so I think maybe I can provide like a list of things that can be sent out. Cool. So yeah. I'm wondering if folks that have been... Yeah, somebody trying to talk? Yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, one thing, uh, we could connect with the uh, uh, OpenWorm project uh, by starting to get into uh, specifically the nerve cells and the development of nerve cells. Uh, and uh, maybe correlate this with the initiation of behavior in, uh, as in developing CLEs. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Um, one comment I wanted to make about mutants is that um, the one place that mutants quasi factors in to this is that the movement validation uh, group um, are, are capable of analyzing movies of adults that are known mutants. And so... Um, we are interested in, uh, on that side, knowing what's going on developmentally in, in some of those mutants that have uh, nervous system uh, problems. Because if you know that, for example, all the dopamine cells are missing, then that, that you can see that in development, number one. And number two, there might be an impact on behavior that you can see that comes out in the behavior. So that ultimately, we want to make the same change to the simulated nervous system as happens in the actual, uh, you know, that is the end, the end point, really, uh, as, as what happens in the um, developing worm. So um, drawing a line between those things might be pretty interesting, actually. Um, that, that's what uh, comes to mind when you say that. Yeah. Steve, could we get, is there any way we can try to create uh, differentiation trees for behavioral mutants. Sorry, I missed one part. Try to create what for behavioral mutants? Differentiation trees. The, uh, you know, the uh, lineage trees put ordered by cell size. Uh, good 
good question. <laughs> okay, in other words, um, given a mutant. So if I heard you correctly. Given a, you've got a, you've got a mutant. Uh, can we go back and watch the development and build up its lineage tree for the mutant? Okay. Yeah, yeah. that would be very interesting to be able to do. Yeah, uh, that's data that we'd need to build a uh, capacity to uh, collect if no one's done it yet. But uh, yeah. Yes. But, uh, the fellow at UCLA uh, is working towards that, so maybe we'll have it soon. Yes, I've been trying to reach out to him actually as well, so it might be another good thing to reach back out with. So I guess we talked about that earlier. So the in mute in a lot of mutants, you do have like variation in the different G, or in the lineage tree, but sometimes it's a matter of like the timing of the differentiation event. So like you have you know sometimes certain cells won't be produced for a while as compared to the wild type, and so you have this delay in the differentiation or in the lineage tree, and so they might have functional effects, but I mean that would be something that you know. I mean, I don't know what the effect would be in the adult, but in the embryo, you would see that. You would see, like, this um, timing difference. And from what I understand, I mean, there are probably other differences, too, but... Yes, uh, yep. Bradley, we can relate the timing differences to evolution because that is uh, a good model for heterochromy, which is yeah. basically differences in the timing of development of of different parts of an embryo. Yeah. And, and heterochrony is a major uh, uh, observed fact in evolution. Yeah. Definitely. Are there other uh, comments, questions here from folks uh, assembled in the panel? Yeah, uh, there was a question I had actually earlier on. It was uh, about the the chord graph that you showed um, is showing the distance. Yeah, you passed it. This one. Yeah, and by the way, Mark, you should introduce yourself because you're the only one who didn't introduce. Oh, yourself. sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Mark Watts. I joined the Open Worm Project uh, 2014 uh, during the Google Summer of Code. Uh, I mostly worked with the Pi Open Worm Project. Uh, really just uh, integrating it more with RDF lib uh, and making an API that was supposed to be easier to use for people just want to build RDF data uh, using Python uh, specifically for C elegance. Um, could you uh, go a few slides down? Uh, down this way? Yes, please. OK. Right, so on uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is the one that I was uh, wondering about. Uh, yeah. So the idea is that you're having uh, cells in different parts of the lineage that are interacting with each other, like you know, in the same time period, is that right? Well, yeah, so the way this works is that you have the lineage tree and you know their sort of position in the lineage tree. Mm -hmm. And we, actually, I didn't show the graphs that show that, like, their position, which is that when, you know, there is a certain sort of uh, difference in terms of spatial location for each type of in the lineage and sublineage. So they right. are sort of segregated by their sublineage, but you can actually look at, like, use a Euclidean distance of their position and look at their sort of, sort of, like, how proximal are they to other cells. And so in this case, you have this large mass of connections, which are actually potential interactions. So any this cell is a certain distance away from all of these cells. They're always some distance, but we're actually filtering out the longer distances only focusing on a distance of a certain size. And so the idea is, is that you know, wherever that cell is, it has a bunch of cells in, its, in a proximity, and then we can actually look at whether they belong to maybe their own sublineage, a different sublineage, or 
if they're proximal to a cell in another sublineage. And then that would, you know, maybe that would tell us something about, you know, um, like paracrine signaling, or it would tell us maybe about like what, you know, maybe where the cell moves after it divides, because we don't, I mean, we're kind of playing around a little bit with the position, because we're just approximating the position, but it gives us some indication of, you know, what might, you know, what the neighboring cells might be. Um, and right, so, so I actually had a question about that. So why do we not know exactly which cells are neighboring other cells? Um, what we have only the nuclei, is that right? Yeah, we, we well, we have the have nuclei. So there are a number of assumptions here. But um, we but we also have we don't necessarily have I mean we have some anatomical information. Mm -hmm. But the idea would be that you could identify in a very sort of high throughput way which cells might be candidates for interaction at, you know, at what, you know, what distance are they away from one another? I mean, you can identify cells at different anatomical orientations and do that, but then, you know, there's a sort of a higher order structure there, a geometry that, you know, we might be able to capture with this. Um, so is that something that we already have captured some uh, higher level structure, or is this just uh, still exploring? This well, I mean, it's you know, it's kind of like a, I don't know how to describe this, but it's not really hypothesis driven. I mean, you know, you're you have a data set and you're using this model to characterize the data. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's like when they do in gene expression, sometimes they'll do these type of networks where they look at, you know, uh, all genes in a genome and they'll look at their expression and they'll see which ones are correlated with one another. Um, it doesn't really mean that there's any uh, actual, you know, causal link or that there's, it just gives you, you know, um, a potential, you know, a potential library of things to look at. And so that's a level of analysis for this. It's not like, you know, you're asking specific, you can't ask specific questions, that's the thing. You can't ask specific questions and then stratify the data accordingly. Like you could extract from the secondary data um, maybe more information about the trajectory of the cells or look at it at a very, like, you know, at one level of the lineage tree only. And say just this level of the lineage tree, I want to know which cells are closer or farther away. And then this pattern of connectivity changes quite a bit. And it gives you different cells that are of interest. Okay. And is this just a, a single point in time, or can you, like, look at, you know... Well, so, this is this graph represents, like, kind of a smearing of time, because you have cells from different points in time, uh, but you can actually look at very specific points in time. Okay, so you would have this kind of graph just at, like, different points of time, whichever cells actually existed, you know, at that point of time. Right. Is that the idea? Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Okay. And have you, you, know, have you actually done that though? I, I yeah, I've been, we've been working on that a bit, and you know, it's not like uh, I didn't put those in because I wanted to just kind of show the general idea, but um, and you know, you get like some interesting relationships, but uh, you know, I'm not like like I said, it's still a work in progress. So. Sure. Great. Is any uh, any other comments or questions here? Uh, uh, probably time for maybe one more before we close off. Yeah. All right. Um, not hearing anything. Hopefully that's not just me. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Bradley for the presentation. Uh, I think it's been excellent. Um, I'm really excited with uh, what's possible uh, in this space and um, these uh, ways of uh, looking at development I think uh, can lead to very interesting data structures that uh, uh, you know that fit together with some of these other pieces together uh, some of these other pieces like the cellular automata um, and you know some of the copy cell stuff um, and they can also are interesting just to analyze on their own um, and do statistics on and to do comparisons um, we talked about ways to compare different trees of differentiation, which is really thought-provoking. 
Um, and obviously, this is the work of, of all folks here in the group. So, um, uh, so thank you very much, guys. I uh, hope folks uh, have enjoyed it as well. Stay tuned uh, for the next uh, Open Room Journal Club, uh, which I'm sure will happen here before too long. And uh, we'll call it to a close for today. Yeah. So, thanks, everybody. Yeah. See you later. Nice seeing you all. Yeah, nice. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.